Panel number two, Translating Aging Research, Bottlenecks in the ro Role of Venture Philanthropy and Family Offices Panel. This is something that's not in my wheelhouse as a scientist, uh, but I think we have uh, plenty of people with finance background here to give me a boost. So the goal of this panel, just to sum it up, it's to give you, the audience, and myself, uh, you know, an understanding of the progress and trends in translating aging uh, research. So we're going to discuss key players like venture philanthropy funds, family offices, and other funding sources that can be pioneers in this respect. So I'm going to start out with uh, just the first question that I'm going to toss to our uh, panelists. And that is basically, you know, how do venture philanthropy funds, family offices, and other non-traditional funding sources play a role in the aging translational science uh, ecosystem? So I think I'm going to take it maybe from my left, and we'll sure. move on to the right, unless somebody wants to sure. jump in. We'll, we'll jump in. Um, so, so there's a few things that are just very exciting in terms of progress, but the short version is uh, there's a lot of both on the philanthropy side and the family office side and other sources of capital that are interested in, uh, that are already invested in the research and different components, but are not traditionally invested on in the company side. Uh, and those end up being some of the sources of, from the venture capital side, uh, LPs, right? So funds are funds are funds, are sort of the money behind the money uh, for uh, enabling uh, more of these very early stage strategies like ours, right? So some of our LPs essentially, uh, that's the makeup of uh, our investors are other successful founders, family offices, entrepreneurs, uh, that understand the challenge. Uh, we're all invested in some capacity on the philanthropic side, uh, but there's this gap for funding uh, on the early stage side. Uh, so that's one area. Uh, another area is uh, the advent of um, donor advice funds, right? So enabling through what would traditionally be philanthropy uh, to uh, donate essentially this kind of that capital uh, in what would essentially operate as a fund, which would then uh, fund some of the companies. Um, and that's very early stage in terms of the discussion, which I think we can kind of deep dive a little bit on. Uh, the opportunity that we're seeing here in New York, uh, so our fund has kind of presence between the Valley and here, but I'm personally here and operating more closely on the family office side as well, so we can deep dive a little bit more then. So this isn't my uh, primary wheelhouse either, but uh, what I've also noticed in my uh, preliminary dealings with this kind of space is there's also a, a knowledge gap here, you know, with certain uh, donor advised funds or family trusts. Uh, family trusts might have a certain amount of money earmarked going to just, you know, a college X or, or whatever. People that would be interested in giving to aging research focus instead of just, you know, a general university or a general topic, uh, but don't really know that there's anything uh, to give money to in this space. So I think there's also a, an important job of finding out what those connection points are, educating uh, these trusts and these people that this is a, a viable avenue uh, to be putting uh, those dollars. I would start out by saying that similar to doing science, investing in early stage science is not an easy game. The most successful early stage investors in biotech are exclusively scientists or successful biotech entrepreneurs that have deep, deep, deep exposure to science. So we deal at Apollo with a number of family offices, um, and my advice to all of them is that the, the outreach that we do and the guys like, like Oliver and Keith have, have done with, um, with LEAF is fantastic because it riles people up, it gets them really excited about the field, and Aubrey, uh, I think that you're very responsible for a big piece of that as well. Um, but then when we think about the commercialization and translation of this, my advice to, to those families, um, and perhaps I have a bias since I run a venture fund, uh, it is to funnel those, those resources through a group of scientists who manage that investment, right? And I guess that that's kind of where the, the three of us um, yeah, sit, sit on this, this panel. In regards to the second piece of this, which is venture philanthropy, uh, I think that that's actually quite a different issue because certain philanthropic groups and I think that the best example of this is the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, have become highly, highly specialized and competent, scientifically driven investors in the space that have created huge amounts of value. So if you look at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, they've actually generated, just for the foundation, I think between a quarter billion and a half billion in returns from a few early stage investments that they made that other Boston and, and San Francisco investors wouldn't make in early cystic fibrosis assets that really worked out. Um, the, the difference there is that they created a team of academic advisors and, and former entrepreneurs to do the actual investment work. It wasn't just 
part of our charitable pocket, so let's give it to cystic fibrosis uh, and a company instead of a, a, a foundation. Anyway. Hmm. Well, investing is a really inefficient business. People can't understand everything, and mostly people who make a lot of money understand some really specific domain that helped them make the money and not uh, the things that their values may be attached to, which is helping people live longer, or their grandchildren live longer with less disease. And, and it's not like in public companies where all the information or a lot of information about the company is disclosed in a very organized way to the, to the whole marketplace who can uh, evaluate it based on criteria or whatever. It's this sort of really inefficient network of friends and friends of friends and people who trust each other and there's a lot of BS and people who are trying to sell you. And there are other people who you've known for 10 years and you know they're not trying to sell you and they're really telling you the, what they believe, but then do they really understand the science? And it's this, hopefully someday it'll all be taken over by AI and it'll just be perfectly efficient. Um, but right now, it's, it's just like friend to friend and person to person. So it's really important to build these networks, to build trust, uh, to communicate as much as you know and let people know you're, you're scientific. And I c completely agree with you about understanding the science. It is a scientific thing. It's not like in software investing where if you invest in some CEO with a lot of charisma and there's a self-referential property where that charisma will actually create success for the company. Uh, you know, what the KD of some particular protein-to-protein -protein binding constant is uh, is not going to be affected by the CEO's charisma. So these people really have to understand the science and be realistic about it at the same time they're ambitious. Uh, so I guess breaking this down into two halves, like the way I relate to investing is having built companies, knowing VCs. VCs often ask me to help them due diligence uh, because who are they going to ask? It's this inefficient network of people who, who trust people. Uh, so I go in and look at companies for them and try to understand the science and tell them best I know. Uh, a bunch of my personal investing has been a result of that, uh, going into a company and saying, holy crap, this is actually really good. Can I invest alongside you? you know, for instance, I did STEM Centrics that way, uh, which had a really nice exit recently. And then also just like through people I know and people I trust. I've also tried to raise money for charities, for nonprofits. Uh, it's ex it's like extremely hard. It's like a factor of a hundred different. Uh, this like something that's really really important. You go talk to people about it and say you should really contribute money to this. And they're like, yeah, okay, maybe I'll give a couple thousand dollars there. Um, versus, hey, I have this this venture that's actually less important to society, but it's possibly likely to make you money. And they're like, great. Where do I write you a ten million dollar check? What? Um, so I think that there's a growing trend of doing things, you know, what people are calling impact investing, where there's some deep value you have in it, and there's at least some prospect of making money back from it that, that checks some sort of mental binary checkbox uh, where you're saying, okay, I'm being responsible with my funds, and it feels good. Um, right now I'm uh, the board chair for an organization I'm excited about called the Longevity Research Institute that uh, touches one of the areas that I continue to feel needs help and is broken, which is and the animal side. And um, they're getting a bunch of you know, seven-figure investment in, in, uh, on the nonprofit side for going through and repeating all the animal experiments in, in longevity as something where you don't really imagine for-profit investors kind of doing that. Um, and yet, it's probably going to reveal some molecules that should be followed up in a for-profit way. So there's a hybrid model happening there. So. I'd, um, I'd completely agree. So the, the, uh, certainly what we see in London is, is a bit of a disaster around high net worths that are, like you say, talking to their network and talking to their friends and not necessarily putting their money into quite the right ventures. Whereas um, if you can go through some kind of network that really does deeply understand the science, that's undoubtedly the way to do it. But I'll go a step further to say that uh, I don't know the Silicon Valley scene, but certainly in Europe there's a real dearth of really high quality startups, especially in this space. Um, and what we're trying to do to solve that is fill in that gap and bring people together like Bobby earlier with the scientists to, to take a more strategic view of what the opportunities are and then bring people together to address those opportunities rather than just push forward the research, which is often, as someone Aubrey said himself, is, is uh, a mission to understand what is there rather than necessarily to find the right thing to translate. Um, so I'd, my personal opinion is a big gap there and high net worth angel style funding in that gap is really important. <clears throat> yeah, um, uh, certainly the role of angel investors is absolutely pivotal right now. And well, I, I specifically mean, you know, investors who 
are able to act unilaterally um, and also who are comfortable with really, you know, high risk, high reward activities. Uh, but absolutely it's true, uh, what everyone has been saying, that if you're not a specialist in this area, then you damn well better be advised by somebody who is in order to decide where your money should go. Um, essentially, um, either employ or delegate to somebody who, or people who, who know, what, know what they're talking about. And so um, in my world right now, I see that in a variety of ways. There are people who just come to me and my my team at Sense to ask for advice and they, um, you know, to the extent that they take that advice, they invest well. Um, uh, but there are also people who prefer to just delegate in a more, um, a more concrete way by essentially investing in another fund. So, for example, the very first um, venture fund that was set up specifically to focus on, um, the, on this field, which was, of course, Laura Deming's Longevity Fund, um, that has recently received a $3 million donation from a group that we also talk to um, and who've given us money philanthropically, but in order to make their decisions, rather than just you know, trying to build up in-house expertise or just ask us every time they want to make a decision, they decided to just let Laura do it. And uh, you know, I'm, fi I'm totally fine with that. I think the, um, the, the, the delegating in that way is, is the right way to go. I will, however, also say something about the intersection and the interaction between the investing side and the philanthropic side, which has become very apparent over the past couple of years. When we talk to people who are investors first and owners second, as the, the thought that Joe was talking about, we try to persuade them, obviously, to be donors as well as, as investors. And the, our main argument is that's how you're going to get access. That's how you're going to be able to come and you know, visit our labs and talk to us whenever you like. And you're going to have the information that will let you be the lead initial investor in the next startup that we spin out or whatever. And I'm pleased to say that that argument is actually reasonably successful. You know, a, a reasonably high proportion of the people who come to us for investment advice will also turn into significant donors as a result of essentially buying that argument. Um, so, yes, the intersection between these two things is extremely important. As I said in my own remarks this morning, um, you know, the non-profit side of things is going to remain the absolutely indispensable engine room of the industry for some time to come. Um, and therefore, it's very good news that the more um, edgy, high-risk, high-reward friendly pe people with deep pockets are willing to put their feet in both camps. Okay, thank you, Aubrey. Um, so kind of bouncing off uh, what you mentioned earlier, uh, James, about uh, Parkinson's disease and, the, and that model. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. Looking at other deep tech and scientific fields, uh, what else, what can we learn, basically, when it comes to, you know, what, you know, which other fields have done a good job of building translational pipelines and ecosystems uh, that basically can then, we can model, so without reinventing the wheel, model, you know, the same kind of network and ecosystem in the aging sector. I guess I can jump in first. Um, so my view here is is not to not to dodge the question, but I don't I don't think we need to reinvent anything. The magic of the aging system as an investment target right now, and the reason that we have seen this step change in the way that we talk about longevity and and aging and geroscience in the last four or five years, is that five years ago, we we, we needed an answer to that question. What do we do with all of these aging things that we know extend lifespan, but, but we don't know what to do with them? Now we have a different answer for it, which is from a, a biopharma strategy perspective. If you are a biotech company and you have an aging drug, something that slows down or reverses a piece of the aging process, you don't need to, to reinvent the wheel. You just need to follow in the footsteps of existing biopharma companies drug companies that are making drugs for cancer or Parkinson's or heart disease or whatever it is. And then the magic, and I want to just tell a brief anecdote here, the magic is that once you do that one thing well, it will have so many knock-on effects because you're, under, you're doing something affecting the underlying biology of aging that you then expand and expand. So there was a key decision that came out of the FDA this year for a cancer drug called Keytruda. And 
What Keytruda is, is, I don't know if you guys have heard this term, it's immuno-oncology, right? It's activating the immune system to kill cancer. And they started with melanoma and showed that this drug could help uh, the immune system kill melanoma cells. Then they showed it for another cancer type and another cancer type. And eventually, the FDA threw up their hands and said, OK, any cancer that has this specific marker showing that Keytruda will bind to it, you can use Keytruda for. That model is so key to our field in aging because if we show something that prevents heart attacks and prevents strokes and prevents onset of diabetes, then they'll be like, OK, just give it to everybody. Yeah, I actually want to jump in next because I want to follow up on something James said about the FDA. Um, so the FDA is often seen as the bad guy in all of this, you know, as the people who hold back the, um, the regulatory process and uh, cause a lot of people to die because they can't get drugs quickly enough. But I think that's unfair. I think that the FDA, first, well, they're in a very difficult position, of course, in general. You know, they have to, um, they're an arm of the government. But the fact is, they are really reflecting public opinion. When we look at the impact of, you know, one person dying in a clinical trial or dying from an approved drug, um, it can be absolutely enormous. And, um, you know, I mean, gene therapy is a great example. The um, famous story of Jesse Gelsinger, who... Um, uh, whose death basically held back um, clinical trials in gene therapy worldwide for well over a year. It was ridiculous. Um, whereas, you know, lots of people dying because they can't get hold of a drug doesn't make the headlines. But the thing about the FDA that uh, is another advance that I actually thought uh, was the one that James, which James was going to mention, but was, well, not this year, it was last year, um, is that they now, for practical purposes, regard aging as a, as a clinical condition that you can have a drug for. This is the result of an enormously laborious and long drawn out discussion between the FDA and a handful of senior gerontologists where basically they ironed out a kind of way of describing uh, aging without using the word aging. <laughs> Essentially uh, uh, describing an endpoint that was very multifactorial and incorporated the uh, integration and interaction between components of aging in, a, in, the, in, the, in the required way. And the result is that a clinical trial is now approved, though it's not happening yet because it hasn't been fully funded, for testing metformin for aging. Um, now, metformin is you know, probably not going to do much good anyway, and even if it does, it's not going to make anyone any money because it's been off patent since before your mother was born. Um, but uh, the fact is, the principle is enormous. It means that whenever anyone wants to come along and actually have a clinical trial against aging for something that they could make money out of, then the template exists now for how you define the endpoint of the clinical trial. And, you know, five years ago, no one would ever have believed that that would ha have happened. The impact on the industry, I believe, is going to be huge because it means that there is no longer this chilling effect on the vested interests of big pharma and the medical industry with regard to the investment that's required to get a drug that far in the first place. And so this is another example, I feel, where five years ago we definitely had some reinventing to do, but now we just need to do what's already in place. So, uh, I mean, basically, I have a question here, you know, and it says, thoughts on how we can speed up the translation of aging technology. So am I hearing this correctly, that we are on track? There's, there's nothing else that we can do to kind of... Yeah, always go, go faster. <laughs> Is there one thing we can do to go much faster? I mean, the, the, <laughs> the poster children for, for taking age-related diseases, of which I'd consider heart disease and cancer, to be, um, and, and getting a, a whole pipeline of ther therapeutics moving up for them, is, is biomarkers. And you know, heart disease has benefited from, from high blood pressure and cholesterol and things like this that have somehow magically been approved as proxies for the actual disease. And they're quick to measure, and they're rapid to change in the physiology of people. So you give them a drug, their cholesterol goes down, and that's the victory. Uh, and you can immediately start marketing that drug. Uh, and in cancer, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a much more short-term approach also. Will this tumor shrink in size? Uh, it's not what I would consider to be the actual aging angle of cancer. And cancer is probably the hugest age-related disease that we have. 
what would actually be attacking cancer from an aging perspective would be preventing it from happening in the first place. And virtually no one is doing this, unfortunately. But looking at cancer as a poster child for how do you make a, 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 like an industry happen, um, you have all these biomarkers, tumor size, uh, five-year survival rate, kind of things that you can actually measure in trials. So to be tremendously successful at the largest killer of all, which is aging, uh, what we need to accelerate that are having more and more and better biomarkers, things that would be accepted by, you know, it's not just the FDA, it's really the bogeyman is payers. Who will reimburse for what? Because uh, people, you know, ordinary people only have so much money and if you go to Blue Shield and say, I wanna take this drug and I want you to pay for it and it's gonna slow down my aging, they will just laugh at you. And so that will not happen. Um, but uh, what we need are, are biomarkers such that there's something you can measure in blood that is predictive of whether you're going to die or not, or whether you're going to become frail, or whether you're going to develop cancer, or heart disease, or NASH, and so on. And you know, we're just starting to get the glimmers of the first few ones of these, but I think that is one of the, the largest challenges, and I think should be projects of this community and this industry. Just to, to jump in, just really brief, briefly off of that, because you mentioned cholesterol, um, which I think is, is one of the key analogs that we have to think about when we're, when we're thinking about making a drug that is preventing disease. Um, the, the road to establishing cholesterol as a biomarker that, such that it could replace clinic, uh, endpoints, like mortality or heart attack endpoints in clinical trials, was a 30 plus year process, right? That started in the 1960s and culminated at the end of the 1990s when those trials were going on and Lipitor, the, the first statin, wa was ultimately approved in, in the early 2000s. The, the seminal challenge from a regulatory perspective for people in this industry and also the FDA is to see how we can use the enormous amount of data that we will have on potential biomarkers for aging to shorten that window that was 30 years, 20 years ago, I guess 20 to 50 years ago, but, but should be able to be accomplished in a much shorter time frame now. That is, that is to me, the key bottleneck in getting this approved so we all take a pill to live longer. Yeah. Uh, I actually kind of want to piggyback on that same point um, in that, you know, th I think there are lessons to learn from other fields and other industries. So uh, the one in my mind, because that's my background, is uh, computer science, computer programming and sort of a, a systems analysis to, from a high level, analyze, you know, what are the lacks in the field? What are the key bottlenecks? And biomarkers is going to be one that I was going to bring up. Uh, and also a problem of uh, reproducibility that's in some sense trying to be attacked by the, uh, the ITP program. You know, parallel, I can't say this word, parallelizing uh, trials multiple times uh, in different uh, labs to verify that the results are, are accurate. You know, to analyze what are the things that slow down or can uh, derail progress and then restructure your, your system's approach to incorporate that. So I think, for example, biomarkers, um, you know, if, if you don't have good metrics to test your results in a timely uh, manner, you're going to be kind of floundering around for 20 years. So you really need to have those target points so you can say, this works, this doesn't, uh, how do we proceed in a smart way? Yeah, I'd add just increasing that collective intelligence. So a, a few of the a few of the slides we've seen today have really rammed at home. One is that, that picture of posters, just posters that are changed every hour or so. Is that really the best way to be sharing information and creating that kind of graph? The, po the point is creating that, that network of intelligence that is across all researchers rather than just these utterly siloed bases which are shared in a few papers. We just haven't got the mental capacity to understand these systems in full, and it's going to be a plateau until we can really do that. Just as a funny quick story, uh, I remember when I was in college, uh, after as a culmination of my math program, I actually did my, my thesis uh, with the bioengineering department. And as a computer programmer, when I was first using like BLAST and uh, sequence analysis programs, I was like shocked at the crudity of the tools that were available in the biotechnology field. And I was like, okay, you know, that's, to me, it also opens up a value of uh, interdisciplinariness, right? I think we need a lot more uh, computer programmers and mathematicians also jumping in to work with, uh, you know, pipetter <laughs> researchers to really analyze how can we move things along in a fast way. Just the only thing I wanted to add in terms of accelerating uh, is that uh, just even a few years ago, uh, some of the funds and opportunities that kind of we all represent or know now didn't really even exist. So, so I'm, I'm um, echoing James on my bias here in terms of 
uh, deploying capital to the funds that have had, and, and they've also to individuals that have had uh, success in the space, right, and can uh, put that capital to work in the founders that already demonstrated that they can do the work. Uh, and the fact that we all sort of know each other and somebody can reference, you know, there's somebody out of Europe and there's an early team and we can say, hey, you know, have you heard about this team or that team or this one or that fund? Um, it's a step change and we can do that with the, on the OP side as well, right? So we can kind of share that uh, because there's, there's, there's more, there's more, cap there's enough, more than enough capital out there for all kinds of funds, all kinds of strategies um, and kind of working together so that uh, that trust within those networks and those ecosystems continue to grow uh, is sort of one thing that we can all kind of do together. So you actually had an answer to the question I was about to ask, James, uh, which was, which was uh, biomarkers and exactly how they can speed up research, which is getting them to be, you know, put into the translational pipeline and accepted as a biomarker um, by, you know, by by the FDA, and how long that would take, and if we can crunch that time down, um, then that would be a significant uh, step forward. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, so talking about other in investors, um, universities, um, they often own a lot of IP research, um, lots of IP. Um, how can they be a value add to the aging translational ecosystem? I don't, I'm not familiar with this term, value add. Um, I come from the sciences, but, <laughs> but, uh, but so if you can explain value add, I guess that somebody wrote that in there. So I, I guess, uh, how can they be um, important to the aging translational ecosystem? Well, the uh, t tech licensing offices at universities tend to be very small, understaffed, uh, responsible for understanding a massive range of technologies from you know plasma physics to to stem cell biology to um, so it's hard for them to really add value and the whole IP department is structured around you know how do we arbitrage some sort of value that we're that we're paying for patent attorneys and how can we get the money back and maybe put some more money in the endowment for the university and um, they're not really an organized way of 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 trying to change the world and move things in the right direction. They're just trying to survive. That said, my experience so far with most of the TLOs at universities is that they're pretty cooperative if the PI is into it. If the professor um, really likes a particular postdoc or grad student wants to start a company, uh, or if the professor wants to be an advisor, and um, the, the TLO will just say, well, you're the one who knows about this, um, and you're sort of a hollowed class here at the university, you're one of these rare, super brilliant minds that we spend so much effort recruiting, then um, we trust you and go for it. And generally, they, have, they, ha they tend to be fairly cooperative. I mean, some universities are more sticklers than others and annoying, but by and large, they're like reasonably standard cookie cutter terms that aren't that binding or restricting to startup companies that want to that wanted, uh, take something forward. Um, so it, it generally doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. Not much value add, but not much value subtract either. Yeah, this, this, this is definitely a, an area, a, a big sort of peep of mine. I mean, I'm an engineer, terminator first, but I'm also kind of IP lawyer, so I've been bashing um, TLOs. And, and one is collectively pushing for a shift in the way they think about, right? Echoing kind of what you just said, in terms of uh, instead of saying, hey, let's sort of extract some kind of random value that we don't even, we don't even know because we haven't even started, um, to more the Cornell Tech model, where it's, Really, the AP goes to the researcher, the institution gets recognized, uh, an equity stake in the potential future company, uh, and then we can all just go and see if, you know, we'll still go to zero if we invest, right? Um, but really shifting that. And, and university ecosystems, some of them are understanding that that's the right, the right approach, and uh, really going from their endowment to have exposure to the funds as well, right? Like University of Chicago, having their innovation funds, and, you know, doing, um, you know, uncap, uncap notes to companies that are spinning out just to really fund them. Uh, you know, the new MIT engine um, kind of funds that are also, so it's really uh, for all of us to target kind of behind the TLO, right, really go all the way to the top, um, which we all kind of have access in different ways um, to support them, right, and know, kind of explain that the value is captured on the exit, not on the negotiation of the license up front, uh, where we're just trying to get it out the door so that we can really help them. What is value add is, will be my only contribution to this piece. <laughs> so so from an, it's, it's a finance and investor term, right? So when you start a company, that company has a certain value. Let's say it's $5 million. And, and we put some money in, and that company, after we put the money in, is worth $5 million. Whatever you do between day zero, when that company is worth $5 million, and then a year from now, when you raise some more money into that company and you have to decide with some other investors what the company is now worth, 
hopefully every activity that you've done is adding value to the company. So now that when you raise money the next year, it's worth 10 million instead of five, something like that, right? So, so a year of your and your team's work was now worth 5 million. Hopefully that makes sense to those non-finance, non-venture folks in the audience. So I used to work in um, Imperial's TTO, which is supposed to be the sort of flagship of the UK's TTOs. So I can kind of see this from both sides. And the thing is, TTOs aren't really supposed to be about value add. They're supposed to be about the most effective all allocation of the small, tiny amounts of money they have to translate stuff into the real world. Um, and, like, and like the guy said, like the three people serving 13,000 researchers at Imperial <laughs> is, uh, is fairly ridiculous. But the, the key to all of it is to go in prepared, so to know what you want out of it. If you can make their life easy, you can very quickly get stuff out of the university and put it into a company. If you're going in with, I've got this thing, I don't really know what to do with it, it's going to sit on the shelf forever. So as much as you can, work with people outside, work with venture investors that really know the field, so you can go in a strong position and just say, I want to do this, how do I get it out? Let's just do this next week, done. Well, since we're actually um, you know, speaking at a college venue, Co Cooper Union, um, you might find this very refreshing to, to hear, but basically um, all the IP here belongs to the researchers. And uh, so if you want to deal directly with the engineers here, go right ahead with very minimal red tape. So just letting any investor here know that. <laughs> that might change after I just said this publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're down to about three minutes here. Uh, we'll open it up to the audience. Any, any questions out there? I see hands up, so I'm going to pass these mics down to our volunteers. Just wanted to make one comment, <clears throat> excuse me, when you talked about cholesterol as a surrogate endpoint. <clears throat> I think there's something to be learned as an example in the HIV area. When that was an acute issue, late 80s, early 90s, um, overall survival, I mean, to be crude, a body bag study was the only way to get an HIV drug approved. But through the leadership of the FDA, NIH, and pharma companies coming together, they pooled their information and their data to show that viral load is an appropriate surrogate endpoint for overall survival, which allowed the FDA then to have viral load as a registration endpoint. I'm just looking at this field the way it is now, and it seems like there's a way to, to understand what's pre-competitive yeah. yeah. and what's, what's competitive information. And maybe there's a role for companies, very exquisite biotech companies, to pool their information in a pre-competitive type of nature to actually accelerate registration and things like that. Just a comment. Uh, I, no I noticed you referred to it as, as an HIV drug. Um, there used to be AIDS drugs, and the, just even the whole languaging of it has changed uh, as a result of being able to use that proxy now as, as, some, as wh whether something is considered a successful intervention or not. Um, you know, HIV antibody titer, for instance, being a proxy. It may be that soon uh, we'll, we'll think of drugs not as a, an anti-aging drug, but as a, like, a, like an, a senescent cell drug. Um, and that'll just start to become standard, standard parlance when we're referring to that particular area. So I like the idea of, of cooperating and pooling information. And sometimes pharma companies do that. Uh, it's really, really hard to get people to do that. So it takes a lot of work, and you have to communicate to them why there is some like mutually beneficial outcome that will happen, and nothing negative will happen to them in the whole process. So it's hats off to you if you can pull off that political magic trick. Um, I just wanted to mention one other alternative to using biomarkers that is kind of like a, 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 a starting to be tapped secret superpower of the aging biology field, which is the use of proxy conditions. So for instance, you know, i is going after this uh, uh, condition through, uh, through um, SENS uh, for, say, uh, age-related macular degeneration, which is emblematic of a bunch of other aging pathway processes happening, but isn't easy to identify uh, and easy to, uh, to declare victory on if you, have, if you have a therapy for it. And I think that not only assembling uh, like a, a, an arsenal of biomarkers, but also assembling a really clearly defined mapping of a bunch of proxy diseases for various of the aging pathways and, and uh, you know, sort of hallmarks of aging, if you will, um, in, in terms of proxy diseases will also be helpful. Um, are you guys looking for, forward to, to, to the day, like say celebrities from Hollywood decides to maybe invest a couple million dollars in anti-aging research and then it makes the news, and then it opens the floodgates for more money to come in, and it 
you know, the general public gets more informed of it and then, you know, the ramifications of that. you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm quite looking forward to that day, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, um, you know, we've been trying to make that happen for quite a long time. Our main outreach coordinator at SANS is Maria Entragues. She's She's lived in Hollywood for 20-odd years. She uh, was a very successful singer-songwriter, and so she has a lot of connections, and she knows how the celebra celebrities think. But even with that inside knowledge, it's been hell on wheels making anything happen. We've had a few isolated examples of reasonably well-known celebrities who've got involved at a low level, like Edward James Olmos, for example, who um, was the star of Battlestar Galactica, um, has given us a lot of his time for free you know, and done uh, voiceovers and videos for us and such like. But there's been very little of that. Probably the only really significant one that's happened so far is Steve Aoki did a benefit for us like, a year or two ago. Uh, but again, you know, it's, we need far more of this. Uh, yeah, I want to jump in here too. Uh, I, I too am looking forward to that day. And that's actually one of uh, our long-term goals at LEAF. That's part of the mission of us doing these big videos with YouTube uh, collaborators that are hitting millions of people is to sort of, in a sense, fish uh, to get people interested and maybe we'll get an email one day and we're also actively you know, working on uh, connections of connections, et cetera. And I think a really instructive model to look at for this is the uh, progression of cancer advocacy where it's you know, started in the 40s and 50s where it was basically just a couple of advocates doing in a sense, slick PR maneuvers like the Jimmy Fund. Uh, you know, oh, people aren't gonna get behind curing cancer, this vague, amorphous thing. So let's pick this kid. Uh, his real name was Gustav, I think. Um, and they built this you know, whole initiative around him. Let's save this boy, Jimmy. And they got all this public attention, which eventually radiated out into getting celebrity endorsements and all this kind of stuff. And then once you hit, you know, stand up to cancer level, when you have, you know, baseball games being devoted to it, you know, now you've changed the game. And that's one of our, like, long-term goals, personally. So. I, guess I would only have one thing to add here, which is I think that it's going to be two very different perspectives. Um, if you're talking about advocacy and philanthropy and support for the research, um, as Aubrey and Keith kind of just got into, versus the investment from the, the commercial side. So right now, we're investing a little over 50 billion a year in cancer therapeutics, if you count the pharma company's investment in cancer therapeutics. That's a lot of money. And, and those players, the pharma companies, and then the, the kind of engine of money that Ramthus mentioned, which is the family offices that are kind of the funds behind the funds, um, when, you, when these guys are looking for places to put their money, and, and there's a Time magazine cover of, will Google cure aging? These guys, they pay attention, right? Longevity in the family office world is in the same category as cryptocurrency right now. It, it's taking the world of these money behind the money investors by storm. The main question for them is, what the hell do we do about it, right? With, with this new field, they want to see respectable actors that have a good track record in the space, that have the network of you know, the people who are going to succeed and then kind of funnel their, their resources and their bets in the space through them. So I think that they're waiting for validation in the market. Quick follow-up, you, you touched on it, but of course it's worth noting that obviously these two things are very interrelated. You know, uh, you could see yourself in a meeting with an investor who is a fan of Steve Aoki and says, oh, I, I heard about that, I've been interested in that, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.